Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. We are going to call the meeting to order at 5.32. Uh, and we're going to go into executive session for a student matter and a personnel update. And I'm wondering if I could have a motion. So moved. Then we move into executive session for personnel matter and a student matter. OK. I'll second it. Thank you. I still need just a little bit of time to get everybody into the uh, things, but I'm close. Yeah, so we are going to do this. We're going to start with the student matter. And for the student matter, we're going to invite Stephen, Amy, Krista. Do I see Krista? Krista, I don't see Krista. But if Krista comes after, please let her in, uh, Mark. And then with us, we have Sharon and and Jeff. Uh, Correct. And, uh, and is Justin here too? Oh yeah, yep, Justin. I'm here. And Justin that is here and is April with us? Uh, and, no. Okay, and then Jen, of course, is gonna come in uh, with the board. Can, can someone clarify who the uh, phone number ending in 495 is? Uh, Jeff Bergeron. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think that's everyone. If I miss someone, uh, let me know, of course. Good evening, everybody. I apologize that it took us a little longer, but here we are. We're going to finish a little bit of business, and then I'll welcome everybody to the community forum. Could I have so I'd like to make Carrie? a motion that we accept Recording the in uh, progress. superintendent's recommendation regarding student matter? Second. Oh, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Scott. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna move to the next section. Just bear with me here for one minute. I put all my post-its today, right? but... Here we go. So welcome to our community forum on budget. Thank you to the public for being here. I wanted to start first today by acknowledging how hard of a week it's been for our staff, uh, our administrators and everybody and how thankful we are for all they're doing to you know, still staying up into our student needs and keeping facilities open as they can and that we support what they're doing and it can't be easy. And we're trying to advocate as much as we can for you guys uh, across the state. <laughs> and then second, uh, January is uh, School Board's Appreciation Month. And I just want to say that it's an honor to serve with all of you. I know that some of you might be stepping out and we're going to have a meeting about that later in the month. But I just want to say also to the board members, like today, just showing up at the, you know, at the last minute for something that we needed to do and it is appreciated. It takes a lot of time. So thank you for all you do in January is your month. So thank you. Uh, now we can get started. Uh, tonight we're here to, uh, to look at draft number three of our budget. It is a community forum. So we're hoping to hear from the public and um, we're going to learn about the current state of our work regarding teaching and learning. And we're going to continue to build the trust with our communities and intentionally, inten intentionally engage uh, with you guys so that you know that your voice uh, matters. We're getting to the very end. So I also want to be very transparent with you that we're hoping that we could potentially also approve this budget tonight if, if, if possible. So I want to start with that. We're not trying to trick anybody, but we will still be taking your your input, but it's just how quickly things move. As we start the meeting, I just want, uh, we just were in a student, um, we were in an executive session right now. I just want to take a minute to just like breathe in and be present and talking to myself too. Just, you know, we're moving into a different part. Uh, this is exciting to to share the budget for the next, the next year. Uh, Please respect everybody's questions. Uh, there's no wrong questions, especially when it comes to budget. Anything that you want to ask, please feel free to ask. 
uh, recognize that we need each other to make this possible and uh, please model good citizenship and we i don't see that we have a lot a lot of uh, people tonight so we are going to stay as a one group we're going to present the questions will be asked as a as a group all together and if needed we will time those questions uh, on a two minute because i don't see a lot of a lot of people here so with that i'm going to pass this on to uh, our amazing interim superintendent jeff Thanks, Flora. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We've been working on the budget for a long time. We are thrilled to present draft three to you. And the presentation that we've prepared is a group presentation from the entire leadership team. You're going to hear from a lot of us. Those who aren't actively speaking tonight did a lot of work, work behind the scenes as well. So, Mark, if you can pull it up, please. Mark will share his screen and we'll get started. Maybe I, I'm gonna try to see if I have that permission right now. If, oh, there we go. Mark is bringing it up, great. So first slide, Mark, yep, there's the home slide. And again, um, Flora, thank you for the, setting the context for tonight. Um, we're hopeful that this is a budget that um, is based on our student needs and reflects our community's values. And with that, um, please advance and Caroline will take over. When done well, <clears throat> budgeting is actually a year round process, which helps us actualize our mission and our values. The budget should be grounded in our mission statement, our students needs and our community's values. The numbers in the budget should tell a story about what we believe is important. Next slide, please. This draft um, reflects the, uh, our commitment to meeting our students and our staff's social and emotional needs, as well as our commitment to high quality instruction and intervention. As we've presented throughout the fall, we continue to experience a difference in performance between various groups of students, such as students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, students who qualify for IEPs and students who don't. We're addressing these concerns in this budget. Common priorities across all three groups for 22-23 include full-time counselors and nurses, access to art, music, and health, a focus on equity, a common teacher understanding of peer or layer one math and literacy, and student engagement and attendance. Next slide, please. So where we're at right now is we took the feedback from last month when we presented draft 2A and incorporated it into draft 3. So this is a summary of the additions in draft 3, including what had been included in drafts 2 and 2A. These additions equal, <coughs> excuse me, a 4.1 FTE increase over last year's budget and I will just pause for a moment to give people a moment to just look at this slide because it's got a fair amount of information on it. So speaking for the leadership team is that we feel like this has been a very inclusive process working with both the community, our faculties, the board, and we can um, really honestly stand behind this budget and say that we have contributed in the decision making and rationales behind these decisions. Next slide, please. 
so some of the position changes that we've had in our budget includes that U32 social studies teacher position. This actually um, allows us to convert some temporary employee um, FTEs to permanent um, so that we can offer more um, options for students to be able to meet their proficiencies in global citizenship. And so we, we recognize that um, this 0.6 increase will, will give us kind of a, a little larger capacity for the school to meet some of our student needs. And also included in this is a 0.2 FTE increase in music at East Montpelier in order to continue providing our students with rich general music, band, chorus, and instrumental lessons. Given the increase in two classrooms, um, this increase is required and will also allow our music teacher to return to teaching pre-K music, something that was taken out of her schedule recently. Next slide, please. We're also looking at a, our programs between Berlin and Callis around art and music. We've spent some time establishing considerations around a number of different factors, including number of students, uh, number of buildings, number of classes per week, half days in buildings, and so on. And our proposal uh, increases art from a 0.3 FTE to a 0.4 at Callis, and from a 0.5 FTE to a 0.6 at Berlin. For music, similarly, uh, we, regarding uh, music and art, we've again looked at number of students, number of buildings, classes per week, and what it takes to have a robust program for art and music. Uh, the Callis music teacher will increase from 0.3 FT to 0.4, which will create a total position of 1.0 FTE uh, to allow full days in one building rather than requiring travel in the middle of the day. So. This 1.0 position will be shared between Berlin and, and Calais. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Myself and Kara, our district uh, special ed director, did some analysis of special education needs, specifically for Berlin. Um, this district-wide assessment <clears throat> for the need for special educators across the district, uh, some work we still need to do in the future to ascertain how to determine the needs of students and the capacity of educators. So we anticipate that this request for a 1.0 uh, increase in special educator would primarily be utilized to meet the needs of Berlin students at about a 0.8 FTE, but have some flexibility to meet the needs across the entire district. So the next piece is the EMES classroom teacher increase of uh, 2.0 FTEs. And I apologize, this is gonna be a, a little bit lengthy, but based on the questions that we got from the board last time, I wanna explain it in two parts. Um, the first part being the explanation for the reason behind two classroom teachers. And then the second part explaining why um, one of those is uh, the recommendation is to come from fund balance. So with the addition of two classroom teachers at EMES, that will allow for all of our classrooms to be within the recommended class sizes. Um, right now with 10 classrooms, six of our 10 classrooms are either at or above the maximum recommended class sizes this year. If we were to increase that to 11 classrooms, um, that would make four out of our 11 classrooms beyond the recommended class sizes. So by adding two classroom teachers, we will be in alignment with our board approved recommendations for all of our classrooms for the first time in actually quite a few years. Um, and then the second part of that is why fund balance and why not um, asking for this to come out of the general budget um, for both of those positions. So last June, EMES lost our instructional coach to retirement, and the staff spent last winter preparing for this and identifying the best way to meet the needs of our students with this FTE. Given where we were at with COVID last winter, our decision was to replace our instructional coach with a third instructional interventionist. Um, many roles of the instructional coach were redistributed to teachers across our building, um, and this model has worked well for us this year. 
Unfortunately, as you all know, we're not at the end of COVID um, and our student needs are still really great. So our hope is that we can continue having a third instructional interventionist um, next year and that that can be faded during the course of the school year to allow for a continuation of 12 classroom teachers in 22, 20, or 23-24. Um, and return back to two instructional interventionists. We never imagined we would need more than two interventionists. Um, however, with COVID, it just, it, it feels necessary to continue this for one more year. This budget also includes a recommendation for the equity scholar in a residence position to, to be included. Since last month when we met, I've had the opportunity to speak with Lucinda Garthway Lucinda is the director of the Institute for Liberatory Innovation that supports and sort of has designed the equity scholar in residence uh, position. So we know that we have plenty of work to do in this area and we do expect that the position will continue beyond next year. And that being said, we're still evolving the model. We're ex um, enjoying a really lovely partnership with ILI so that they're learning just as much from us about how the position works in school and doesn't work in school and all of the nuances that we're still refining the model. And so we feel comfortable making the recommendation that it continue and that it be funded with um, fund balance next year to just give us some more time to figure out exactly what it might look like and sound like in the years to come. Next slide, please. Develop slides eight and nine to illustrate more clearly the impact of new program and service requests on the budget, local ed spending, and the tax rate, as well as proposed use of fund balance and grant funds. The leadership team is requesting $263,000 funding from the general fund for new programs and services, which has no offsetting revenue. The team is also requesting an additional 180,000, which we are re recommending the use of fund balance to offset. Regarding the recommended recommendation to use fund balance for these two expenses, we just provided some rationale. We know that historically the board has been inclined to use fund balance for expenses that are clearly one year only. We also want to balance the impact on our communities and you will see shortly in this presentation that the tax rates in our five towns will be different due to the CLA. Next slide, please. The team is proposing to utilize 59,000 of ARP ESSER funds to support additional time for a paraeducator at Doty and another 0.5 literacy interventionist at Callis. It is important to remember that ESSER funds are a temporary source of funds. 91,000 of Title IV funding would be used to offset the cost of a new educator for the high school RISE program at U32. This program is similar to the current SPARK program in the middle school. RISE means restorative in-school experience and is envisioned as an intervention service to support kids socially, emotionally, and academically so that they can more fully and more successfully access their classes. Next slide, please. Next week, Kara will present more information to the board regarding the impact of Act 176. 173 legislation on the delivery of special education services. This table il illustrates the changes from the current funding model to the new funding model, effective 7122. The mainstream block grant and reimbursement model for students under $60,000 have been replaced by one census block grant with funding based upon the district ADM numbers averaged over the prior two years. This results in a decrease in funding of $498,000 or 13.6%. <clears throat> the reimbursement model for students over $60,000 remains, however, the formula has been altered to provide additional funding to the district. The total increase in extraordinary cost funding is $590,000 or 94.2%. We should note that some of this increase is a result of an increase in the number of students and the overall cost of services provided for individual students. There is no change over last year in the method of funding state place students or pre-kindergarten students receiving special ed services. We do anticipate a reduction in state place student expenses, which results in a decrease in revenue of $205,000 
or 55.1%. So the total uh, reduction in special education revenues is $133,587 or 2.8%. Next slide, please. The expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend. The revenues are the amount the district anticipates receiving to partially offset expenditures. And the net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by state and local education property taxes augmented by other ed fund revenues. In page 41 in the finance packet, there is a detailed breakdown, breakdown of the changes in the budget by category. Uh, cybersecurity hardening increase of about $114,000, deferred maintenance coverage uh, around $94,000, an increase in transportation of about $25,000, updates to current staff salary and benefits, uh, net education spending, so expenditures not, not offset by proposed revenues would need to be reduced by $194,957 to get this budget to a 3% increase in net ed spending. Next slide, please. Equalized pupils is a two-year average of the district's average daily enrollment, or ADM. Adjusted by several factors for pre-K and secondary students, students in poverty and limited English proficiency. Equalized pupils have decreased from 1,431.5 to 1,423.57. This combined with the increase in net education spending results in an increase of $831 in local spending per equalized pupil. The local spending per equalized pupil is what determines the equalized tax rate. The article for the budget warning must include the total expenditure request, the local spending per equalized pupil, and the percentage increase in spending per equalized pupil. Next slide, please. The CLA is a comparison of each town's total property value on the grand list versus the fair market value of properties. The higher the fair market value of properties, the further under 100% the CLA will be. As the CLA decreases, the tax rate increases. This is how the state provides taxpayers with an equalized grand list across the state, and it is out of our control. A CLA drop of 0.6% equals approximately one cent on the tax rate. This table compares the CLA for each town in the district year over year. The district saw decreases ranging between 4.21% and 13.86% with the most significant drops in Worcester and Berlin. Next slide, please. Equalized pupils have decreased from 1431.5 to 1423.57. This number may change and likely will change uh, as the AOE have, has some uh, pieces of the puzzle that haven't been incorporated and specifically for our district um, students that are doing early college have not been um, factored in and so we've factored a number in for those students of 10 into the 1423.57. Uh, nine students equals one cent on the tax rate. So if that number alters by nine students, the tax rate goes up or down by one cent. The property yield is set annually by the legislature and is used to determine the equalized tax rate. $83 equals one cent on the tax rate. A CLA drop of 0.6% in any one town equals one cent on the tax rate. So on a house valued at $100,000, on this version, which is scenario A from the tax commissioner's letter, which is a, um, I would say the, the more favorable scenario where the Ed Fund uses $90 million to offset tax rate and uh, to reduce the tax rate. So a home in Berlin uh, would see a reduction of $36, a home in Calais, $158, East Montpelier, $197, Middlesex, $162, and Worcester, $110, on a house valued at $100,000.
And in order to get a $200,000 house, you would multiply that by two and a $300,000 house, multiply that by three. Next slide, please. This slide shows scenario B from the tax commissioner's letter where uh, none of the $90 million potential ed fund uh, balance is used to reduce the tax rate. That amount will be determined by the legislature as they proceed this uh, term and they will decide how much and, and at the end of the day, set that property yield number, which tells us what our taxes will be based on. In this scenario, Berlin sees an increase in taxes of $72 on a house valued at $100,000. Uh, Callis sees a decrease of $41. East Montpelier decreases $83. Middlesex decreases $48. And Worcester increases by $3 on a house valued at $100,000. Next slide, please. So we have been working on this budget, getting feedback from uh, the board and the community and staff throughout the fall. We have been so grateful for the parameters that the school board set, and we believe that draft three um, meets these parameters. So specifically to recap, um, we do believe that we are addressing the social and emotional pillar for students and staff, especially through some of the maintenance of the work through the ARP ESSER funds as we're continuing to experience the, uh, the throes of the pandemic. We believe that we're addressing the multi-layered systems of support, including continuing professional learning for our school community. We are in, uh, proposing an increase in intervention at Calis for literacy and um, an increase the, um, that rise position that we described earlier for you tonight at U32. The board had asked us to stay under the penalty threshold based on prior years. There, it, it doesn't exist, but it's a really good marker for us. Um, and so draft three is $19,498, which is approaching that penalty threshold, but under it. Next slide, please. We have um, definitely budgeted some money for hardening for cybersecurity as requested by the board. We have focused on um, really continuing to boost and grow the arts and music. So we've seen those increases in um, FTEs for elementary music and for elementary art. And you asked us to have a contingency plan for expenditure reductions should the tax rate not be favorable. And that is something that um, should you ask us to do that or need us to do that, we, we have been thinking about that and working on that. Next slide, please. So here, here's a synopsis of the next steps. Uh, in, in January, we're right here on the 12th Community Budget Forum. You can, the 19th is when the final budget is, uh, should be worn. So it is possible that the board will both discuss and approve the budget tonight, and we could decide that we want to provide more feedback to the leadership team and see another draft for approval next week. It, January 19th, as you see there, is the final date in approval order to get everything worn and to, to the printers and the town clerks. So we also look ahead to the future uh, correspondence and interactions with the community, uh, as you know, and to bring the, the voters all the information they need to make an informed decision. And um, what you see on the page right now is really a synopsis of the steps, like I said before. So we're gonna open it up now to questions uh, by the public on the proposed uh, draft three budget. So I think we can stop sharing the screen. Oh, or Jen, sorry, I, I guess I missed that last. Uh, it's that all last good. That was, no yeah. worries, Fleur. That was just again a, a little bit of a summary in terms of some next steps and um, just a really a, a reiteration of what you had said in the previous slide. So I think we are definitely ready um, to open it up. Thank you. So let's see if I see any hands up. <laughs> 
I see I see Jeannie is here, Becca is here. I'm trying to see members of the public. But I don't see any hands up. <laughs> Hmm. Scott, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, Dorothy Naylor, I think some of you may have seen, wrote an email. And with your permission, I could act as I have on many occasions before as her ventriloquist's dummy and um, sort of relay her, um, her statement as a member of the public. So let's do one thing, it, it, Scott, just the, for, for process. Since we have, uh, I didn't notice that Holly had her hand up too. Let's let Holly, who actually lives here, go first, and then we'll move to that. Is that okay? All right, Holly, welcome. Hi, thank you. I did have my hand up after Scott. Um, I, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to thank the leadership team and everybody for creating such a succinct and thorough explanation for us to see what the changes are in the budget um, and to give all those justifications just really help us understand. Uh, I know that's a monumental task. And just as a community member, I really, really appreciate all the time that I know you all put into it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Holly. So I appreciate it. it Scott? Thanks, Laura. And, and thank you, Holly, for that. Um, this is from Dorothy Naylor, whom I think all of us on the board know as, um, as a board member emerita. Um, and I'll just read what she has to say. Dear Washington Central Board and Community, although Ben and I have moved to Bennington, our hearts are still in central Vermont, and we are still taxpayers. When I was on the board last spring, I asked the board to recognize and support the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, CVTSE, in its quest to urge the legislature to adopt the Pupil Weighting Factors Report from December 2019. This report tells us that school districts with students from rural areas, students who are poor, and students needing English as a second language need more money per student to provide extra support so these students will thrive. Weighting students with scientifically established numbers will affect equalized pupil counts in every district. The equalized pupil count is, as has been explained to us, an important factor in Vermont's unique and complicated education funding formula. January 2021, the coalition worked very hard and hired a lobbyist to help them persuade the legislature to consider and eventually pass S-13 in the 2021 legislative session. S-13 recognizes the need to use the empirical scientific information provided by the pupil weighting factors report, which was requested by the legislature. Pupil weighting factors now in use and which have been in use for nearly a quarter century, were not based on any scientific research or logic, simply numbers rather randomly selected. For over 20 years, students in many school districts have adequately funded. It is time to do the right thing. I understand that Washington Central is in a good place financially. Therefore, now is the time to support the coalition financially for this legislative session. With support from a hired lobbyist, the coalition has shown it can get results in the legislature. So I, Dorothy Naylor, am asking Washington Central to include up to $5,000 in this budget to support Central Vermont um, uh, TSE, um, Coalition on Student Equity, um, in its quest for student financial equity. VSBA supports what CVTSE is promoting and Washington Central is, again, a member of that body. Washington Central prides itself on attention to equity in all areas. By doing this, 
the Washington Central Board shows it understands we are all in this together. We support providing the funds needed so all Vermont students are the best they can be. If not now, when? Dorothy Naylor. Thank you, Scott. Are there any other questions from the from the public before we dive into the board? Hi, Becca. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for yeah this presentation. It was very useful. Um, um, it was super informative and while the pupil waiting factor feels a lot like a black box to me, um, I'm hopeful that we can come out the other side with something that is more equitable. Um, that seems like a, anyway, that's a, another conversation that I would love to learn more about at another time. Um, in the, for the moment, I one thing that I continue to think about a lot as we've navigated the merger and all the changes with that and the budget is um, how hard it is to really see how some of these changes in the budget and recommendations actually impact schools on an individual basis, especially the elementary schools. Um, and so I have two kids at Rumney and um, I know that there's gonna be some shifting of staffing and I'm just wondering if there's any information about how some of the shifts, especially around the art um, teacher might impact some of the schools I know we're adding some F, some some portions of a full time position, but I'm just wondering if that's actually adding time or rearranging time. It looks like it is adding time, but I'm not sure that that's actually. I, I'm wondering if there's a shifting happening that's actually um, drawing some teachers away from one school to put them into another to try to sort of equalize stuff across the different elementary schools. And I just want to make sure that as we work to find equity within our schools we're um we're reaching higher you know and and instead of saying well it's not fair to have so much art at one school or, or spanish for example at rumney and not spanish at other schools just making sure that we're not going to ever be in the position of um say you know cutting a program at a school um because it isn't equitable rather than saying okay how do we figure out creatively to make sure that we can have all children in the district access these really important wonderful programs that are available at one school but may not be available at all the schools not sure that was clear um but maybe it was and maybe someone can help me figure out the answer to it um Jen. I'm happy to speak specifically to the kind of the shift in the the art um given that you, it sounds like you know Romney. And so we do have a shared staff, a shared art teacher between Romney and EMES. Uh, we went through a process as a leadership team and also with the art teachers to kind of work through what that all might look like. Um, the shift is going to be, so right now that the shared art teacher spends two and a half days a week in each building. And on Wednesdays, the art teacher starts her day at Romney and ends her day at East Montpelier. One of the agreements that we came up with earlier in the fall was that it's really hard to have shared staff split their day among two buildings. And we tried really hard to create FTEs and schedules going into next year so that wouldn't happen. So they could start and end their day in one building. Um, in order to do that, and also in looking at the needs in both of those buildings. So where Romney has seven classrooms and East Montpelier has 10 and will be 12, we shifted the FTEs so that the art teacher could spend three full days in one building and two full days in another. So it's a, it's a half a day shift a week so that for two reasons, one, so that the day doesn't have to be split between two places and also to um, address just the difference in, in number of classrooms and students in each building. That might've been more specific than you were looking for, but that's kind of, Caroline, I don't know if you would add anything to that. That's super helpful to me. And can I just, I think that that before you, I want to make sure I hear what Caroline is going to say, but I think that's what's so troubling to me about the new merged budgeting process is that as a parent, I, I'm, I would, it's important to me to know that we're losing a half day of art instruction at my children's school. And that half day is meaningful. You know, I, I, I and I really love and value the art instruction we have at Rumney. And so I just, it, we didn't lose a 
we didn't lose any staffing as a district, but it does have an impact on the children in different schools. And so thinking about, well, you know, what would it be like? And I, I just want to preface it by saying I understand the budget constraints are real and they're challenging and we are working in a system that doesn't actually work for students, teachers or school boards, right? And I want that to change and I, we all deserve better. So just wanting to make sure that that's, you know, I, I get this rock in a hard place that we're in, but um, I'm still find myself really frustrated by the fact that we may not have, we actually gained a staff, right? We, or we gained 2.2 hours of an FTE district wide, but Rumney's losing a half day of art instruction. So, and that's not at all transparent in the budget. And I'm just curious process wise, like how, how do we know that? And how do we learn that? And how can that information be shared with the community so that we do have a chance? And I also recognize that we're the final hour here too, right? So like maybe some of these things, it's a little late to bring this up, right? So how do we learn that earlier on to say, okay, this is how this actually impacts these individual schools and know that maybe there's not going to be art instruction in the pre-K classroom in Romney next year. Well, there isn't actually now, but anyway, that might be a COVID thing, but, but like, you know, so how does that actually impact the kids in individual schools? And I know some of this is probably too granular for this space in this process, but um, as little community schools, as part of a larger merged district, it actually does feel important that half a day is it's a, it's a one-fifth reduction in that person's time at Romney. So I would, um, I think that it's, Caroline, you have some more specifics around sort of that impact. And then I wanna to speak to the process a little bit after that, just Becca to, to clarify some of where that was presented and then, you know, we can always seek feedback. So Caroline, you wanna just elaborate on what Alicia said first? Sorry, my mute button kept disappearing. Yeah, so at Rumney, so it is um, half a day. What we found was that in terms of the general art classes, we can offer the same amount of direct instruction in art um, for the same length of time and the same number of classes, uh, fitting it into two days. The piece that would shift is the time for, um, integrated arts that, so if a classroom teacher has a specific project, sometimes they access the art teacher to assist with that. Um, and so that would be sort of the, the access to that would be what is shifted. And so in looking at this, um, Alicia and I really talked about how if there was a special need, um, like a teacher doing a special project that they've done every year um, around geography, and they always utilize the art teacher for that, that um, we could have, uh, with some planning, we could still have access to the art teacher. Maybe East Montpelier would get a sub um, for that week, so the art teacher could spend the week um, at Remney adding the time. And um, it will be a little bit of a shift, and we'll have to do more in terms of planning. Um, but um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought of uh, how to end the, that thought. But um, so I think it will take a little bit more planning and some shifting. But um, in terms of the access to general art instruction, um, that will still all fit within the, the two days. And then I would just speak to um, the, pro the process piece, Becca, that you raised. When we presented to the community last month in the budget forum, we did uh, present a slide about non-budgetary impacts but shifts in, in FTEs. So there's also a, a shift in the in Romney PE um, in looking at Romney and Doty, how that works and how we can best meet students' needs. We presented that and the art. We chose not to present it this third time around because we were focused more on the numbers but we always welcome feedback around how to continue to provide the community with the information that it needs while not overwhelming anybody with too much information to process at any one time. Thank you. Okay, is that, uh, okay. I think we're done with that question. Was that your only question, Becca? Otherwise I'm gonna to move to Jim. You, you're muted. Yeah, it was. I guess I just I I'm, I just want to register my um, my hope that um, in the future we can figure out ways to add 
um, a day so that there's a way for to not have to lose services in one school to make sure that another school is getting what it needs. I think that integrated arts is um, is really a, an important part of learning, especially for children who learn in different ways. And if equity is one of the things that we're really trying to, to improve upon in our district, then making sure that children can access um, concepts and ideas with um, different modalities, especially um, tactile and art um, is really important. So I just wanna um, underscore that I hope that Going future, going forward in the budget, we can figure out ways to to make things equitable while raising the bar um, and still keeping our tax rate fair and um, should be fine, easy, right? Um, <laughs> Thank you, Lincoln. Yeah. Thank you. That's really good input. Uh, Jay Campbell. Oh, there's a picture now. <laughs> I see. You. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. And um, I just, I just want to just say that there are a few other things that might be impacted by a shift. And I realize that um, I realize that the administrators and are trying to do what's um, best for the students and me as far as trying to make sure I have a balanced workload in the two schools. But I also feel like the robust art programs that we have and the individuality of the schools um, may be suffering at this point um, because of this. And I don't, you know, working in two schools is tricky. Um, I am the art teacher at EMES and Rumney School. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. My name is Jen Campbell. Um, and so anyway, I, I feel like it's a really difficult situation to be in, but, um, Yes, I feel like more than just integrated arts might be impacted. And I have mentioned that before, um, but even working in two schools this past couple of years, I don't know what it would be like to, with COVID around, I, I haven't had the opportunity of really um, doing the robust programs that I'm, I've done for many, many years. So. I just wanted to share that information that it's not only integrated arts that's going to be impacted, and I have mentioned that before, but other things, and it, it does feel a little bit like it's going to be even more tight to do anything like that. So just reiterating, and those are my, you know, I, I, I love the arts, obviously, and I think the kids at Rumney and I've just started working at East Montpelier during this pandemic. So the last couple of years, this is my second year. So I haven't had the opportunity so much to work with the kids in that capacity, but um, I think they benefit uh, tremendously from, from the extra enrichment programs that I have done in the past. And I think that EMES students would also um, so that's all I would like to say. Just wanted to share my thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. I, I have, a, Becca, you have your hand up again, and then Michaela, you can go after. Lauren, just my son, Lauren, who's a first grader, just wanted to say hi to Ms. Campbell. Lauren, can you say hi? Because he really loves her class. <laughs> that is. <laughs> hi, Lauren. <laughs> Okay, Mike. It's great to see kids. Michaela. Um, hi, thanks. So um, I guess I wanted to comment as a community member more than a board member at the moment. Um, that um, I totally hear what Becca's saying, and I, I think equity is is super important. So I just wanted to like emphasize that. And I know it's a complex question, right? Because there are a lot of ways to look at equity, but I think as a um, Community member, it's difficult to um, to really gauge equity because I, I feel like it's not easily accessible information necessarily. Like, um, you know, I, it took a while for me to understand where we were lacking music teachers in the district, and you know, I always just assume like no elementary schools are doing languages, but like it sounds like maybe some are, and. Um, so just a 
not having to do with this current budget, but just, you know, future leadership planning, making that a little more transparent um, would be helpful. That's all. Thanks. Not transparent, just easily accessible. I don't mean to say you're not being transparent. Just, just easy to find that information. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Thanks, Claire. Um, and I'm, I'm asking to go because I have a, a hard stop at seven. Uh, but I wanted to just offer some comments on the budget, uh, which I think um, the administration has done a nice job uh, in terms of presenting it, uh, touching all the bases that need to be touched, uh, and responding to our to our comments um, and and um, our hopes for the budget as a whole. Um, I would urge that we uh, move the equity and scholar funding into the general general budget because it's um, even though uh, Jen explained that the model is evolving, uh, the the cost expenditure is not evolving. It's going to be uh, uh, something that is continuing on for years. So I don't think we can justify using the fund balance um, for that purpose um, um, on a, you know, a one off. I think we should incorporate it into the budget as a whole because uh, it's something that we are supporting and we want to continue. Um, and even though the model may evolve, the funding uh, for it is not. It's going to be, I think it's going to be somewhat of a permanent fixture. So I would urge that we incorporate that into um, our, our general budget. Um, I, I still kind of feel the same about the second um, East Montpelier teacher, although it's, it's not as clear that, that, um, that the additional behavioral position will continue on, although I strongly suspect that it will because we're not even near the end of COVID. And, and I can't imagine that behaviors are automatically going to improve dramatically um, just because we're out of COVID because it's slow to ramp up and it will be slow to ramp down. So I, I, I again, I think that that is a position that we'll be seeing not only next year, but the year after and maybe even the year after that. So from a, from a budgeting standpoint, I would, want to pull that position into our budget as well, just so we have a, a planning tool of what we're going to be looking at in the future. Um, but overall, thank you very much. A really nice presentation. Um, I really like the clarity of, of the, um, the numbers. And, and Becca, just we did talk about what the impact would be for Romney um, in previous meetings. And I know we can't all attend all the meetings, but uh, Caroline explained um, in, in a previous uh, meeting what the impact would be, uh, but it was good to hear from Jen Campbell because it's a, a different perspective too, but um, thank you very much. And uh, I fully support the budget um, as framed right now. And I would support Dorothy Naylor's comment on finding uh, 5,000 and that could come from fund balance because that's not an ongoing expenditure, I don't think. So thank you very much. And I have to sign off now, but I appreciate the uh, time. Chris, sorry, before you go, what was the second position that you were talking about? The first was the equity. The, the second position was the um, second teacher at uh, East Montpelier, which was slated for funding through the fund balance. So you know, I, support the, I, I support, completely support both positions because the numbers really bear it out. Um, and that was very helpful to see that um, in the packet. It was thank a you. classroom teacher, sorry. Classroom yeah. teacher. Okay, yes. thank you. Chris, before you go, can I just respond to something you said, just so you don't leave with some information? No, no, no I want to get, a, no, I want to just, Elisa, I don't want you to change my mind. No, <laughs> no, I just want to clarify. It's none of this is about behavior. They're instructional interventions. Oh, instructional, okay. Yes, I just didn't want you to leave thinking it was behavior interventions. So, and- So then the, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Why um, are you hiring, you're hiring another instructional assistant? No, we, okay, we, tell me. yeah. So this year we have three instructional interventionists. Okay. So they provide interventions to students who are not at grade level. And that would continue through next year. And also with two additional classrooms, our class sizes would be smaller, right? So our classroom teachers would have less students. So the, the goal would be that between the interventionists and the classroom teachers, the students' needs would still get met. I just didn't want you to leave thinking it was about behavior. 
can I ask a question, follow up to your, to your comments? Um, sure. The um, instructional interventionalist um, is due to the impacts of COVID, I'm assuming? The one maybe, additional for this year support. is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is there, are you seeing any um, evidence that um, students are doing better than they had been? Um, or is the impact of the COVID still having a fairly detrimental effect on student achievement so that there is a real need for the instructional interventionists? That's a really good question. One thing I would, I'm hopeful that the leadership team can present to the board in a very near future meeting can be looking at our winter assessment data, which will give you the answers to that, right? We took, we did had fall assessments. We're right in the middle of winter assessments right now. Our hope, all of our hope is that we're seeing growth in student achievement. And those assessments will help paint that picture for us and, and show us where we're at. My hope to, to your question is yes, we're seeing gains. Did you see the gains in the fall? From last year? Well, did you say you had fall assessments this year or? Yes. And was there any gains in the fall assessments this year? Based from last spring, yes, there's growth. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's helpful. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Bye, bye Chris. Uh, just a, a, a process clarification. The, uh, uh, I'm just going to make sure that there's no other public comments or public uh, questions, and then we can move in so the board don't feel like you're not going to be able to uh, dive into deeper questions uh, before we approve a budget. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, thank you, Chris. Have a good meeting. Thank uh, you. Sorry, you have to leave. Me too. Um, okay. Any other questions from, from the, the public? I don't see any hands up. So I guess we could, any other clarifications from, from staff on the budget? I don't see any hands up. I just wanna say, you know, thank you to the administrators, to Suzanne, to the whole leadership team. This takes a lot of time. This is probably in my history of being a board member, this is probably the most transparent budget process uh, now that we've been uh, unified too, but it's just, uh, it's, it's really incredible to see how everything is gonna be allocated and to have those, uh, those explanations. And I know that you guys were collaborating with your staff too. So I we really appreciate all, all that work. Um, and it is hard to be able to have uh, all the resources we need for all of the needs that we will wanna, you know, have. Uh, Kari, you have a, a hand up. Yeah, thanks. I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment's really very much like what you're saying, Flora. I want to commend Jen and the team for doing a really excellent job with the budgeting process this year. I thought it was it was exemplary in how you responded to our direction and then incorporated input from staff and from the community. And you mean I think you really took that part of it seriously and, and reflected it back and did a great job with that. My question, or well, so here's a, here's a thought I have and a, and a question. Um, one part of this budgeting for school, school year that's always been somewhat dissatisfying to me is that we're always looking at one year at a time. And I think there's probably a lot of reasons why we can't do multi-year budgeting, or maybe I shouldn't say we can't, but we don't choose not to. Um, but as a board member, you're left wondering, you know, what's coming? What, you know, where, where is this heading? You know, Chris was, Chris was getting at that and with his comments. And so I just thought um, it might be in, it, interesting to hear if you have any thoughts, were you thinking in terms of what's coming next year? Are, are there big picture items that the board should be aware of, like, like Esther grants or, um, you, you, you name it, I, I don't know, but things that the board should be aware of that are, um, that might inform our th thinking this year because they're gonna be so significant next year, if that makes any sense. Thank you, Kari. Jen? I can start with a few thoughts and then um, and then let's see uh, what other people, how, how folks would respond. We ha haven't had that specific conversation about uh, framed in that way as a leadership team 
and hear a few things. We really wanted to be clear um, in this presentation that we are funding some things with ESSER monies and those monies are finite and they will be going away in a few years. So we wanted to be clear about that. There are other sources of funds that seem to be reliable, a little more predictable and ongoing, such as the Consolidated Federal Programs money, the Title I and IIA and IV funds that we use to fund some positions. There, we had a big conversation around pre-kindergarten. We mentioned that a few meetings ago and the idea of really thinking about um, what uh, robust and sort of wraparound pre-K and expanded pre-K. And we did not go down that avenue for this particular budget. Um, we also on occasion would sort of say, well, what if, and now that we are unified, we have some opportunities to explore that and we sort of put that out as, well, what if we looked at um, shifting a few things? And those are conversations that I think are worthy of deeper exploration, maybe when it doesn't feel um, so tied to, to the budget process in terms of the actual numbers or a finite budget. The other things I would add are one, um, as much as money is a resource, a uh, finite resource, time is a finite resource. And we've had lots of conversations about that. And that would lead me to sort of my final point, and that is um, the importance of our community undergoing a strategic planning process, because that, I think, will help us figure out and prioritize both financially and in terms of time our most important things, because we're going to rub up against all these amazing things we want to do, and we only have so many hours in a day and so many days in the year. That Those are my preliminary thoughts. I would invite the team to chime in. Thank you, Jen. That was very helpful, Gillian. So, Kari, I think it's really interesting that you brought that up because one thing that we did talk about a, a bunch is that we really need to button this budget up and then start thinking about next year's budget and start really looking at our budgeting process in a much more sort of comprehensive and long-term way and really looking at what are the resources that we have kind of across the district and thinking much more planfully. So um, what I think is exciting is that you're asking the kind of a, a very similar question of looking ahead and, and looking forward. So I think of this as a really kind of exciting opportunity for us to not you know, spend every single board meeting on the budget, certainly, but to come up with mechanisms that we can have to um, inform you of thinking along the way and get feedback from the board so that it's not sort of this mad dash in the fall that we start playing through these things like, well, what if, what if we could get five day a week childcare for three and four year olds in all of our elementary school? Um, you know, things like that. So thank you for asking that. I think it's super exciting. Thank you, that was helpful. Kat, you unmute it yourself? Oh no, you're not, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So I guess we have inadvertently moved to 4.1. So it, Let's just discuss the, the budget and a couple of things that were, were brought up. So it's open to the board. Any other board questions or suggestions? Uh, oh, Diane, I see your hand is kind of. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think Becca got at a little bit of what I was wondering about um, again, because wanting to be sure I asked the question in the right way, because I think that's where I slipped up last year. I didn't ask quite the right question in the right way to get the full information. So other than the music position, which will be shifting, are there any other positions in any of the schools that are changing, might not be, um, the position might not be being cut, but are there changes that are occurring in any of the other positions um, that might uh, that might just take a little more explaining um, if we're making those choices. Does that make sense? 
So PE is is a shift in FTE between Dodi and Rum and Rumney. And Gillian and Caroline worked on that one specifically and can share more. But that again, we're looking at. Um, the needs of the buildings, the school populations, how many classes, all of those things. And we feel like that is a shift that allows us, so specifically actually um, a non-budgetary change that we're thinking about would be that Rumney PE is currently 0.7, we recommend it be 0.6. Doty PE is currently 0.3, we recommend it be 0.4, that's a shared position, so it remains 1.0. And um, just like the, the art position as well, having them be full days mitigates the need to, tra or eliminates the need really to travel in the middle of the day. It maximizes staff time. It uh, supports sort of a more thorough presence in a building on any given day. And it still allows us to, to offer what we're offering now, right? With not a, a loss of service. And Gillian or Caroline, anything you'd add to that? Yes, I think just to, to, to put it into the, the actual nuts and bolts, so to kind of see what it is, um, because PE has to be um, twice a week. So the point three, the way it was, is our PE teacher would start the day in Rumney um, and do, I forget, Caroline, if both days he was doing one class in the morning um, or the, the, uh, the Rumney schedule I know has shifted somewhat but he would do either one class or no class in the morning at Rumney and then race over to Doty. And <laughs> it's adorable actually, but you know, he pulls up in front of in front of the building with his car, unloads his gear, drags it in, goes, parks his car, frantically sets up for his first class at Doty. So um, and I imagine there's a reverse process that that happens at um, at Rumney on those days. So it really um, sort of made a lot of sense. And we discussed it with the teacher about, um, would this make your life easier? Uh, you know, it's a gear intensive position. So Caroline can talk about how it impacts those two mornings, but definitely for us here at Doty, it adds, it adds a level of sanity into the teacher schedule and allows him the time to have a little bit of time to go check in with teachers, find out how kids are doing um, and work with some of our special needs students. Yes, so um, the Tuesdays and Thursdays that the PE teacher is at Rumney, it's just in the morning, I forget, um, so it's a point one, which means um, a point one adds up, I think, to half a day a week split over two days. So it's just in the morning time. So it's not, he, he actually doesn't teach PE on those days. He does cover um, for classroom teachers who have team meetings and he does some other things. Um, but in terms of PE classes, we can have those on the three full days that, um, that he's here and it does save him the, um, the commute back and forth. The one other thing I would add that we had sort of briefly presented last time is we also said school assignments for paraeducators. By and large, our paraeducators stay in the building, but I wouldn't want to promise that everybody who's where they are right now would be exactly where they are, you know, in the same building next year because we base all of that on student need. We're looking at it, we know our needs right now. We know that needs shift. Sometimes students move in and out. Um, and so it's, it's, our, it's our hope to keep people where they are and want to be. And we recognize that there may need to be some shifting as kids move from, for example, triple E to kindergarten or sixth grade to seventh grade. Um, so that was something we put and that might be a possibly non-budgetary impact personnel shift. Any other specific questions from board members to administrators? Diane, is that a new hand? It is a new hand. Um, okay, nice. So, um, oh, why don't Maggie, why don't you go? And since I just wanted to wait and not hog, so Maggie, go and then I'll go after you. Go ahead, Maggie. Okay. Um, 
with the awareness that staffing para educators has been so challenging this year, how much forewarning would that staff expect to receive about potential opportunities to move to a different school um, if they want to re remain employees? Just ballpark. I can start and then principals, you can chime in here. We are typically talking about transitions for kids um, in the springtime. I mean, formally we have transition meetings in the spring. Sometimes it happens before then. Sometimes it's happening just along the way in terms of talking about student progress. That's not a super specific answer, Maggie. I don't know if principals, you have a, an example or two or more insight that you could share than, than I provided. So I, I was on negotiations last year with Jonas, and I believe there is a procedure that's outlined in the agreement so that we make sure that it, it provides those protections of, of the emergency type situations, but also being clearly um, identifying when those moves occur. I guess, Jen, the only other thing I would add, and we had this case this year where there's right students may move in or out during the course of the year in any one of our buildings and there's a vacancy and so say a student moves out and there's a vacancy in another building right those conversations are had and we've been able to move our ESP staff around that way as well which is which has been a huge benefit to buildings looking for someone. Thank you Alicia and Jen. Diane, you had a question and then Maggie, is, you can go ask her. <laughs> yeah, so my, my question is about the presentation, which thank you, it was very, very clear. I just had a couple of um, detail questions. So on slide four, it's the one where it's talking about, um, it had, let me, I'm trying to find my slide four now. Um, it was the one that talked, it had the, budget draft number three summary, and it included the, the art teacher and the special educator and the equity scholar. And then on the right-hand side, it said, including from drafts number two and number two A. Are those all in the budget or is it just, I just wasn't clear if it was all and it looks, I'm seeing nodding, so it's, it's all, thank you. They're all in there, yeah. Okay, perfect. And then the other question I had was, um it, it's great explanation but i real what's our bottom line i don't know what our is it the 4.28 um you know i, I guess i'm just not 100 percent clear what's being said would be the um the percentage and i'm not trying to be difficult i just i'm not quite clear susan it uh, the the bottom line number that the board would need to approve is thirty six million one hundred sixty nine thousand two hundred sixty seven dollars. Um, that was I don't remember on which slide, but the one that talked about the expenditures. So the board needs to approve the expenditures, and then the other piece that's included in the warning is the per equalized pupil dollar amount that's derived by that that total. Okay, so it's the 3.39% increase is what we're looking at. Yes, I'm, I'm looking for the page. Hold on one minute. And it was uh, in the I think slide it's page 11. 12. 11. Okay. I just want to be sure I'm clear on, on that. And then the scenarios A and B is the state will decide which one they're they're doing on that as to what the the final, but that's based on the 3.39% increase, both yeah. of those scenarios, okay. Exactly, Diane, although I would, um, normally the board includes that table about, um, that was in the slides that I showed scenario A and scenario B in the annual report. Normally the tax commissioner gives just one property yield and this year he gave two. So I'm curious to know which one, or if the board would like to include both in the annual report. I, I would be interested in direction from the board on that. 
Thank you, Suzanne. So let's do question number one uh, first, Dan. So is that clear? Were you able to find it? Okay. I, yeah. And I had sent you guys the finance packet too, because I felt it was a little bit easier to read it there, that everybody was able to look at it in there. Uh, Lindy, do you have a question? And then we'll get to, to the other part. Hold one second, Lindy. It was about what Suzanne was just saying. When this is ready for our report, won't we know which of these from the tax commissioner? No, the, the tax commissioner gave us his December 1st letter and he provided two numbers. He said, if the legislature decides to use $90 million to, to offset the tax rate, then it will be this number. If the legislature chooses not to use it, it will be this number. So he gave us two numbers to use. Most uh, business managers are using the more conservative number, which shows the higher uh, higher tax rate. And that's actually what I showed you last month was the more conservative one, but I, I thought that the board might also like to see the, the other possibility that might happen. It could be somewhere in between too. <laughs> When will the legislature make that decision? Uh, I think they said it in February last year, but it's it's after you 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 do your warning. Okay. Yeah, Scott, and then we can give them feedback if if you we don't mind taking. Maybe you're making a motion, Scott. Go ahead. Actually. Um, I, I will make a motion, then that won't stop the discussion, I presume, correct? Yeah, no, so, that's correct, uh, yes. I'll move that we approve budget draft number three. Thank you. Could we... Um, is oh, there a second, second? <laughs> Yeah, so um, that was you, Kari? That was Kari. And, yeah. and yeah. if I may, Fleur, just to... Yeah continue um i uh, i would be in favor of the conservative option um that Su uh, what suzanne mentioned that other business managers were doing i think um a pleasant surprise is so much better than an unpleasant one so could i have thumbs up just on that second part if people will be okay with the more conservative well, approach and then we'll vote on the motion because we were going to keep discussing but i don't want to forget about that so i just want okay to clarify my understanding of conservative because um so the conservative is at the higher rate so is it right? a or b b is b. what it would be b. B. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah. B. yes the other right. option is to present present them both as the tax commissioner presented them to us. Uh, I, I understand the concern. I'm all about conservative, but I also don't want to lose a single vote because someone perceives it to be too much. I, I would yeah. agree, Kari, and I guess, and I'm sorry, Flora, I didn't, I was kind of out of order. Um, but my, my feeling too is this is information that every tax payer and voter should know so that there's the opportunity to voice your opinion to the legislature about both of these things. And so if we only provide one set of the information, then um, we make it a little more uh, deeper that they'd have to look to find that. So I guess my suggestion would be that if we provide we provide both scenarios, but we put a you know we we put either an asterisk or something that says waiting for because I don't want to confuse people. Some people will get confused when they have two different uh, scenarios there. So just just say that we're waiting for approval. Not everybody knows that that's what we're doing, waiting for approval. We're not asking them to choose one or the other either. So that just add a little note there, Suzanne and Jen, that we're waiting for approval is that reasonable for everybody okay and now let's continue the discussion on the budget if there's more questions before we call a vote and scott i haven't forgot about your what your request but i'm 
um, my suggestion would be that we, uh, Jonas and Chris were not able to be here right now, that we do that on the 19th because we can always add. Uh, I'm still here for it. Oh, you are there. Oh, I don't, see, where did you go? I don't see your little emoji. Okay, you moved. Okay, there you are. So go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Laura. Um, this time I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I'll be my own dummy. Um, I agree with everything that Dorothy said, except the part about putting it into the budget. I think I would be in favor of taking it out of fund balance now. If it's in the budget, then we don't get around to it until, you know, July 1st of, of 2022. The, um, the action is going to be in this legislative session. So if I could um, make a, um, a request, please, that the question of <clears throat> making a contribution to the coalition be on our January 19 agenda, just as a separate item, if that would be acceptable. Yeah, that's what I was hoping. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other clarifying questions to see if we could vote on the budget tonight? Is the interest in voting with the budget tonight, and like I said in that email, is that we would also want to set the tuition. We have a deadline on, on the tuition. In order to do that, we have to approve the budget. And I can let Suzanne speak to that. Lindy? In in the um, motion, should we have that number, the 36169 in the motion instead of, it was a little vague to me to approve the budget when we've been kind of seeing other things here. I, I would say, yeah, let's include the, the numbers, Suzanne. If we, we're gonna need it for the warning, so. Is the 3.39% one yeah. on the top? Yeah. So if we want to include that in the motion, uh, a friendly amendment. Scott and Carrie. Okay. Uh, Lisa, do you have that number in front of you? You might not have it right in front of you. Liz. I have the, it was on the back. dollar amount, but I don't, I don't have the percentage number that you were talking about just now. It's $36,169,267 is, is what you'd want to include in the motion. Yeah. Okay, got that. Thank you. Are we ready to vote on the, on the budget? I don't see any other hands up, so I'm going to go for it. All of those in favor of approving the budget, please say aye for year 2022-2023. And the motion as read. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries and is unanimous. Yay. <laughs> so the second part, if you don't mind going on, is we were want to set the tuition uh, tonight, which is basically uh, from the budget. And that is when we can put that up in the screen too, but it's on four point. Um, I moved all my post-its, sorry. So it's on page 57 of the finance packet that I sent you. And Suzanne, do you mind uh, giving the number? Uh, Scott, you have it right in front of you. I, I do. Um, Thank you. I can make can a make motion. motion if you like. And that would um, be wonderful. Okay. I move that the board approve and announce the FY 2022 2023 district tuition rates as $21,253. For elementary tuition and twenty thousand three hundred thirty-eight for secondary tuition. And Lisa, I can read those again if um twenty-one thousand two hundred fifty-three dollars for elementary tuition and twenty thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars 
for secondary tuition. Thank you. A second? Second. I'll second. Okay. There were two, two voices there, and I think it was Ursula and Lindy. I want to give it to Ursula. Just well. it's, it's John. <laughs> okay. So Scott moved. Yeah. Ursula, second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries to unanimously. Thank you, everybody. That was quick. So now we can move into a personnel update, approve new teachers. So we have just one change in FT. PE for um, for this this week's or this month's board packet, um, and that is Amy Koenigbauer. Amy Koenigbauer teaches in our pilot program. She's returning from a family leave and is requesting a change for the rest of the year from 1.0 to 0.8. And we would be um, we recommend that change too. So I'm looking for a motion to accept. The change in you want me to make the motion? Yes, um, please, Lindy. I make a motion to uh, accept the change from 1.0 FTE to 0.8 FTE for Amy Koenig Bauer at the U32 pilot program. Thank you, Lindy. A second? Second it. Thank you, Diane. Any discussion or questions? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that just for this school year, or should I just leave it? Um, it's for this school year. For this school year. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. and update in vacancies, Jen. Oh, we just did this. There hasn't been a lot of change since last week. Um, one piece I want you to know, you remember you signed, um, your, you authorized Flora to sign on your behalf the driver's education MOU from the fall. We had a sentence in there that said that um, we needed to meet together if both parties agreed we would extend it and we needed to make that decision by the 14th of January. We have been talking with the association. We've been actively uh, advertising. We still have the vacancy. So we agreed to just keep it short and sweet. One sentence, both parties agree to extend this memorandum of understanding. And um, we are in the process of collecting those signatures from the association co-presidents and floor um, so that we are still enacting that um, for the rest of the semester. There's another clause in there that says that um, we need to meet in April to um, see if we need to do a second MOU around summer needs. So that's definitely on our radar. Um, so that continued vacancy just generating that particular MOU, but um, we will extend it for the spring. Thank you, Jen. So that brings our meeting to an end. So I will be looking for a motion to adjourn. Oh, Diane, your hand is up. Yeah, I just, and I apologize again. It's so okay. I just looked at that last page of the, fi of the finan financial committee packet which talks about the tuition. And I, my only question is about the projected enrollment because that doesn't match what we are currently at. And so my concern is that we need to be sure we're explaining that our numbers are not that. I mean, the number I saw was at East Montpelier was 239. So that's dramatically different. And I believe it was 209 at Berlin. And so, um, I guess it, I just want to make sure that we're being clear with our community how many students we have. Uh, those numbers won't include any of our Act, Act 166 kids, no pre-K. There's certain numbers that are pulled out because the tuition's only on elementary and secondary. 
So that's where you're seeing the differences on those. And it's a projection for next year's students, not this year's. Alicia? Can I, can I just add to that? that um, Diane, the numbers that you're referring to, uh, Michelle Sepka took all of those from our October 1st count, and those do include all of our pre-K students, which is why those numbers look different to you. Thank you, Suzanne and Alicia. Kari. Yeah, I just wanted to check, is now the time that we all have to go up to the central office and sign the warning? Not quite yet, but it, we're going to let you know, but it is it is coming. It, it is coming up. It, Suzanne, we were going back and forth with Mich Michelle, with, with the, uh, Rosie and and Melissa on that. We, we're not quite ready, but we're going to be sending you an, an, an email and the scheduling for you guys to to come by and, and sign. There's several, yeah, several ones. You also have, we also have to sign the Career Center one too. Any other questions? I guess we lost most of our community members, but I just wanted to say thank you again for putting, it, for putting this together. This was uh, a lot of work and we really appreciate the the transparency and mostly the collaboration between between you guys. I just wanted to add one last thing. I think the things that we are going to be facing in the future, I agree with all of you that we have to start planning ahead, just right, finish this budget and start planning. But we also are, the school board alone is not going to be able to to, to do all this all this work through the strategic plan, like Chen was saying, and community involvement because the decisions and and the looking really holistic at our structure and potentially being able to provide childcare in our district, it's it's, it's got to be a community a, a community decision. So, you know, we have a lot of work to to come our way, but it is super exciting because there's so many opportunities in our in our district to provide integrator arts, you know, and other to to all our kids. So with that, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I also want to thank Chris for being here. There's and all of the other administrators that just, you know, chose to join us today that didn't necessarily need to be here. Your support is appreciated and your work is appreciated too. Okay, now for real, let's go have dinner. I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank Thanks, Scott. Second. Second. Thank you, my God. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye and leave. Aye. 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 Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.